<laughs> hey everyone and welcome back to Music Therapy Mondays with Melody Hager and Aries Wicks. <laughs> and today we have a very special guest, Miss Kashana. Am I saying your name properly? Sure, thank you. That was perfect. Kashana Armstrong. Yes. I was working out your pronunciation on your website and I've beat it into my brain. So I'm glad I can get it. <laughs> Awesome. And so thank you again for joining us today. Um, I think being able to talk to different music therapists across the country is very special. And you yourself are a former music therapist. Um, and I'm sure Eris can attest this is going to be a super cool conversation. And we'll just go yes. ahead and get started um, with the conversation. So just a few questions. Um, if you don't mind just giving a brief, a brief background as to who you are, um, what your education was, and how you sort of discovered your passion for music and how that sort of started. Yeah, so um, I am originally from South Carolina. I'm from a town called Irmo. The, um, and when I, was, when I was coming up, there were not that many places to study music therapy. So I had only a few options. And the University of Georgia was the closest to, to where I grew up. So, um, and they had, there was one program in Furman, but you could, you could like create it, but it wasn't a hardcore music therapy program yet. So I studied at University of Georgia. I got my bachelor's degree in music therapy and studied oboe as well. And um, during that time, just did a lot of work. You know, you have to do uh, clinical hours. So I was working in nursing homes and we had a um, partnership with the hospital doing some studies uh, with FSU and um, working with babies in the NICU and helping them feed again. And so that was another experience where I actually got to use my instrument and in using the oboe and English horn in the NICU setting. And um, also worked with um, people that were in, experiencing incarceration, worked with drug and alcohol uh, programs and those that uh, had uh, developmental disabilities. And then I went and did my internship in uh, New York at Beth Abraham Hospital, working with Oliver Sacks and doing um, studying neurological music therapy and psychoanalytical music therapy, which was like a hard left turn. Uh, University of Georgia was a behavioral music therapy program. So uh, it was really cool just to study other ways and see other ways of um, how to really do improvisation, working with the Nordoff Robbins Institute and stuff up there. So um, but I eventually ended up coming back south. Uh, and worked in Atlanta for years, working in middle hospitals, working with uh, the incarcerated, working with uh, youth detention centers, and doing a lot of private contracting, working with Emory Hospital. And then I, my last job was working with youth in a program, um, in a school setting for kids with uh, emotional and behavior disorders. And it was when I was working in Atlanta at the middle hospital that I actually started writing music. Um, I was doing songwriting with my clients. So that was like my introduction into songwriting. But our goals were always to, how to write mantras, you know. So I wasn't out here trying to write a hit, you know. But um, it was honestly, the songwriting started with, um, with those in the mental hospital. And then when I was working with kids in youth detention centers, I got into production and how to do like beats and freestyling. And it just kind of like progressed from there. And I uh, got a little burnt out. Nobody told me when I was coming up that you get burned out doing music therapy and mental, mental health. So um, I found that uh, I was, I thought I would take a year or two off and just do songwriting and touring a bit. Um, and then that is all I've been doing for the last like 12 years is songwriting. And I'm back in the music therapy world, but not as an official music therapist now. But yeah, that's uh, the quick checklist of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> interesting so you've worked with a bunch of different populations and I know Eris has been working with some of the babies yeah um, yeah it's rewarding right it's very rewarding yes yeah Absolutely. that's awesome where are you at so I did my internship at UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital yeah. and I was working in the NICU and I was working with youth in um the oncology unit and the hematology unit, um, also the PICU. Yeah. And yeah, you, uh, you're right on the money with, with the burnout thing, you know, <laughs> it's very easy to get yes. burned out. Um, and it's definitely important to take care of yourself. And so it's good to hear that you took that time off um, mm -hmm. after you started experiencing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
you know, it's something that I do wish, um, and maybe they are teaching that now, you know, but um, that was something I wish had been explained to me, you know, about taking time, taking time off and like finding outlets. Cause I started using songwriting as my own outlet. You know, uh, I was trying to take my own word <laughs> from what I was telling my patients to do. I was like, I'll take my own advice maybe. Um, but you know, I've, I've ended up, I needed to step away cause I feel like I needed to find this other way of doing music therapy. Mm -hmm. which is through songwriting because now the songs I write are based off of the clients that I used to work with mm -hmm. people that I've met. Um, and what I found was that I was, I was kind of the bridge between the outside world and the inside world. So there were a lot of things people didn't know that what the experiences were like for those that were behind bars or, um, or that were in institutionalized. And so, um, I kind of, uh, just kind of held on to that purpose of I'll be the bridge and letting people know that are out here walking around every day, that there are people just like you, you know, that are struggling and, you know, you'll never meet them. You, you probably will never experience a life that, that they experience, but just know you're not alone, you know, mm -hmm. and the same for those that are in institutions, you're not alone. There are people out there that are having the same issues. So, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what was your initial uh, inspiration for getting into music therapy? You talked about a lot of the populations, like were there any specific experiences that you had before then that inspired you to go into those populations or? You know, I, I used to use music as like an escape. So when I was young, uh, piano was my first instrument. And so whenever I needed to process something or if I had had just a hard day, um, just trying to cope, I would just close my eyes and go to the piano and like escape. And so I love to tell stories. Um, like Beethoven was my favorite or is my favorite. And so I would just have these movies, like, you know, movie scenes in my head and I would just play. And I thought I wanted to study psychology. And um, I met another guy who was, um, we were in a cotillion together or something. I was like in 11th grade. He was like, but have you heard of music therapy? And I was like, no, I haven't. Because I knew that I wanted to study music. I mean, I wanted to study psychology, but I also knew I needed to do music for scholarships, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there was one music therapist in Columbia, South Carolina, only one. And so I went and shadowed her one day and she was working on the children's unit in our hospital downtown. And I think it was watching her use her voice and, and just musical notes to... Um, affect a child's heartbeat and breathing rate and like the fact that she knew how to watch the monitors um, to look at like saturation levels and, and all that. I was just like, this is awesome. I want to do this. <laughs> but um, to be honest, it took me, it, this is why I liked, I loved my undergraduate experience was because I was put in so many different uh, populations. I learned real quick that I don't have the temperament for children. I am not bubbly, you know. I don't have the energy for that. Um, and I love a challenge. I love um, having to think on my toes. Um, I love being uncomfortable. And so I just kind of gravitated towards the harder, like, quote unquote, you know, more difficult populations. I don't know if that's the right way to say that, but I just gravitated towards those that, um, I, I felt maybe it's because of the link of me always wanting to escape other people that had escaped mentally. I just really wanted to like go there and try to like find them where they were and how can mm -hmm. I gr help ground them or how can I just kind of enter the world that they're in, you know, mentally and offer them music as a way of coping and escaping their uh, traumas that they were dealing with. Yeah. Wow. That's really inspiring. I I would attest to the fact that, yeah, working with children, you have to definitely be bubbly and on a lot of the time, <laughs> not only for them, but also for their parents as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, working with other populations definitely gives you that opportunity to dive more into what the ment mentality of someone who is literally, like you said, escaping looks yeah. like and how yeah. you can intervene and hopefully bring them to a place of comfort so that they can feel more present. Yeah. Yeah. It's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of changes did you see when you were working with uh, your incarcerated population? Because I feel like 
there is such a misconception when it comes to incarcerated peoples in our country. And so I just, I'm curious to know how that affected them and how your work um, potentially helped them um, throughout their time. Yeah. So when I was working um, on the forensics unit in Atlanta, our, our clients were the ones that I, I worked with, they were actually on the track for being released. So our whole goal was um, reintegration. So we put them in a band. Um, we put them in a band called the Melotones. <laughs> Melotones. <laughs> so the whole point of that was social, um, social skills, social interaction, teaching them how to like, first of all, learn a new skill, right? Like, you don't know how to play the bass, we're going to learn today. Um, but uh, it was, I think that was, a, that was the first step of, of watching these men be rewarded. Um, like their self-esteem boost went up, you know, um, watching how they would interact with another, how they would problem solve in a moment. If um, they, uh, also we got the opportunities to put them on stages to perform in front of audiences, not only their fellow um, patients, but like, we even took them to Charleston to perform for the board of all of the state hospitals. And for them, it gave them a, a sense of purpose, you know, and they felt like they had a voice uh, and they could speak to the issues that they had in their own facilities. And I mean, that was years ago, but even recently I've been teaching songwriting inside the women's jail he, um, here in Nashville. And uh, the women, when they come in, you know, the first things they'll say on day one are like, I don't have a voice. I can't sing. My mama told me I don't have a voice um, or I don't have anything interesting about my life. My story isn't interesting where, you know, so it's all these negative thoughts about themselves. By the end of our nine week class together, they are, they've written like three, at least three songs as a group. They've told their story. They are singing solos, you know, um, they, we found that within the in, within the um, the jail setting, the officers will call on them as the leaders um, to speak up towards to, to the wardens if there's any issues. They they're asked to sit on boards, so it's the same thing of like that self esteem boost. They find the voice, and you know I have uh, one woman who um, has been released, and she's actually songwriting on her own now. Like she's writing. And she's sitting in writing rooms with actual songwriters here in Nashville telling her testimony. And she was like, I never would have thought I could do this if I hadn't gone through that course and, and experienced a songwriting class and known that my story is even interesting, you know? So, I mean, I think from, I mean, the basic level is just seeing their sense of purpose and self-esteem go up, which can affect all kinds of things. That can affect your mood. Um, that can affect how you interact with other people, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. So this mission of being able to heal people through your music, heal the hurting, um, how have you seen that affect how you engage with your audiences? It sounds really inspirational hearing how, you know, you were able to inspire the inmates or, or the incarcerated to, find their own voice? How have you seen that affect people that you perform in front of? Yeah, I, uh, I think since the beginning, since I started performing, because I did not grow up singing. I was always a piano performer or an oboe performer. So my voice was not something that I, I was used to using. Um, so I, I used to always have to think of every performance as a music therapy session. So I'd be like, everyone in this room is a client, <laughs> you know? And so that made it easier. I could turn on the charm, you know? Um, and I still do that. And what I found is when I'm, I think a lot of times the, the healing, the connection, the therapy in my performances comes in the, in the storytelling. Mm -hmm. So I always try to lead into every song with the story of where it came from or what it is that I've, I, I had to work through to get there or a client that I worked through had to get to the point that, you know, of the chorus of the song, what's the purpose of the song. And what I find is when I'm done performing and I'm at the merch table or, you know, CDs or people are just wanting to talk afterwards, they are often like, 
I have been struggling. I needed to be here tonight. I needed that message tonight. Um, or my daughter has been struggling with addiction and I want to buy the CD and give it to her. So I find that people do feel a connection to it and they, they're still finding the healing. I don't think of myself as a regular kind of performer. I do think of what I do still as music therapy, mm -hmm. even if it is just a way of letting people know they're not alone and giving the same way that I started with my patients, we're writing songs of hope and affirmations, mantras. And so if I can give you a CD that has that and you could pass it on to someone that you know is struggling, then I feel like that is how I am continuing the mission of being a voice and a vessel for those that feel lost, forgotten, silenced, or are hurting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, that is really inspiring. And just hearing how music therapy is able to help feed that ability is just that's so impactful. Yeah. I, wow. I, for years was like I, trying to get rid of the, I was like, I'm not a music therapist. I'm not a music therapist because you know, there is a stigma in our, um, in our field. Absolutely. You know, if you don't have your credentials, like you shouldn't be calling yourself a music therapist. And I really respect that. Um, but I know that I also practiced for years, ran an internship and like, I've done, I've done some work, you know, so <laughs> I feel as though I'm not going to call myself a board certified music therapist, but I am still doing music therapy. I know that my approach is still from the therapeutic standpoint, you know, and it, it, I think I got lost for a little while, especially moving to Nashville. I thought I had to have the hit songs. I thought I needed to go be on the big stages and have the publishing deals. And in the end, I realized like, no, you, ha if you just have a mission, like just still keep with your mission statement. And it's amazing how having a mission for myself, just kind of like the road straightened out. And I was like, ah, here I am. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Still music therapy, but just with, with songwriting, you know, mm -hmm. and production and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. So speaking about Music City and just more of like a broad thing, um, what is living in Nashville like? I'm very curious, um, coming from a musical family, and having a lot of musically inclined friends, a buddy of mine moved out to Nashville for a little bit. Um, what is that like for you as a performer? Um, and I guess coming from your background as a music therapist, um, do you see any of your peers um, in the music industry sort of doing the same thing that you are? Because what you're doing is from an outside perspective, very unique. Um, okay. My dad plays music professionally and he gigs in Charlotte. Um, and he makes incredible connections with people, but what you're doing is taking that a step further. So do you know of anyone else who's doing that in Nashville or even regionally? Cause I can't think of anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, um, songwriter friends here who do, um, use their platform and their music, uh, for specific, um, purposes. Like they also have missions that they're just different than mine, but they are still doing the same thing. Um, like right now, you know, the whole mission is get, getting people out to the polls. So I have friends that are using their platform and their connections to just motivate and activate people to just get out there and vote. Um, and there's an artist named Daphne Willis that I met when I first moved here. And, um, you know, she deals with, with mental illness and like she deals with stress and she's become you know, a big advocate of that. And so she uses her platform all the time just to uh, motivate people to just speak openly about mental health um, and just is honest and open. And I've just found, and I've watched her since I've known her, like straighten that road up and have that mission and see how she's using her music for a specific purpose as well. I mean, in general, Nashville's great. I mean, it is an amazing, like the thing to do when you come here is to find your tribe. And I've been here coming up on seven years now. And I feel like I found a good tribe of people, of artists, where I've lived in many other towns. I've lived in other music towns where it has felt a bit competitive. You know, mm -hmm. there's no competition here, not in the tribe that I'm in and not in the circles that I exist in. And everyone literally does have their hands behind them, just like, come on. Let me pull you, hey, look, here's an opportunity. Let me bring you along. And that's something I really uh, love about this town. Um, I really do. Everybody is always trying to connect and like pull you in on something or they have no problem um, introducing you to someone if they feel like, hey, y'all need to meet because I think, you know, this could be a good connection. 
And I feel like creatively people are just always creating here. So um, it's, it's nice. Even when I am like this year has been really hard. I think for those of us that are been pulled off the road and that have had a purpose and a mission. And so just having a tribe to talk to, and we're all trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we just shift what we do in a different way and move it online? You know, mm-hmm. um, it's been nice to have a family of artists to kind of talk to, but this, this town is great. It's very touristy, but if you know where to go, <laughs> it's great yeah. food, great hangs, great music all the time. Um, my dad came to visit uh, last year and I took him down on Broadway and he has his camera on. He's a musician too. And just watching him walk down Broadway, just smiling, because every window, there was a different band, you know, you know, and then we found, you know, and then we found a guy who was playing blues in a hotel lobby, and he was like, let's sit here for a minute, I'm going to get a Coca-Cola, you know, and so, okay. (laughs) So I do love that, that you can hear music anytime you want, when, when things are normal, you know. Yeah, that's so cool. I love hearing that you have your group of people um, with their purpose, because that for me is very reflective of the Miss America organization. And I think specifically the Miss North Carolina class of 2020, now 2021, we've got an extra year of service. Okay. Um, the women in this organization are so amazing um, and we're each tasked to have a social impact initiative. And mine is Music is Medicine, Music Therapy Matters, where I advocate for the practice of music therapy and meet wonderful people like you both Um, who are doing slash have done the work um, just to be able to educate people about it. But there are so many other things that my sister queens are involved in um, from being aware of diabetes to supporting our veterans to childhood hunger, just all kinds of different things. Um, But that that competitiveness is replaced with support and and uplifting. So I think it's really neat how that can parallel um, itself in so many different ways and so many different places. I think that's super yeah. cool. Yeah, and I think it's so important that, you know, like you're saying with the platforms, and that's how it is with so many artists here. We all have different platforms um, and that there's no competition, but we're all there to help push each other's platforms, you know? Mm-hmm. And we need all of those voices to help get all the awareness out because we can't handle it all. <laughs> right. exactly. exactly. If we Absolutely. could, it'd be done, but yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. Well, I've, I've never been to Nashville and that's been on my bucket list for a while. And I was just very curious personally about how you liked it. So that's, yeah, I'm glad it's treating you. Nice. Yeah, it's a great place. It really is. Y'all should come visit. And it's great. It. Mm-hmm. I'm <laughs> it's on this side of the country, but we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> so more general questions. Um, part of my social impact initiative is I host jam sessions. Um, I'm lucky enough to have connections with musicians um, in the regional area, lucky enough to be a singer myself, um, to be able to perform. But the idea is I get local venues to donate their space, local musicians to come out and donate their time, and a local music therapist to come out and talk about what they do. Nice. Um, and so it's a very, it's a, it's a big endeavor. We want to spotlight the music therapist, absolutely, and raise money and awareness. But it's also just a really cool community outing where people can get involved. Um, And it's always so neat for me to be able to see just how moving music is. So what is your opinion about um, maybe even taking it outside of music therapy and just sort of the general philosophy of what music does for us? Um, How do you think that healing has impacted your audiences and the people that you've worked with? Like, Like, what part of us as human beings do you think music impacts? It's a very philosophical question. Yeah. I, I, man, I feel like music is a connector, you know, you can have people from so many different backgrounds and experiences um, and classes, like sitting in one space. I can travel from country to country, play the same songs, and the stories that I get are the same. So I feel like it's a connector. Um, And it also, I think, helps us tap into it's some people can process better through song. They hear things better through song. You know, I could sit here and talk to whomever and they'll just be like, Oh my God, make her stop talking. But if you put it in melody form with some chords, you know, and little story before, I don't know. I feel like you can, uh, music is a way to just kind of like latch on, you know, uh, a little bit, a little bit better, but philosophically speaking, 
I find music to be like, I just did an interview with a friend of mine about this. I think it's, it is a way to gauge where we are as a people. And it is a way for us to assess like where we've come from and where we are right now, you know? And, and if you want to take that into music therapy world, even music has played a part in all like so many different phases of our lives, right? You have a soundtrack from when you were a kid, you have a soundtrack from when you were a teenager, and then when you're in your 20s, 30s, even 40s. So like, you know, all you have to do, it can, it can help you time travel, you know, with those that are, that are like losing time, our elders that are losing time, music can bring them back to that time. So it's like, I find it as like a timekeeper and a way for us to tap into, into our humanity. It can be a connector because bringing up songs and bringing up music from the past can spark conversation um, across generations, across races. Um, and it can really just, I think, spread a message further than any just speaking voice can. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I totally agree. Uh, music definitely is a connector and it's, it is a universal language that we all can speak. Mm -hmm. And just like you're saying, you know, just being able to tap into how it can be a timekeeper, it can be a transportation station, you know, to yep. take you to different moments in life and different feelings in life. Um, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah music is yeah. very powerful in that way. And thankfully, we all have that innately. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. even people that are like, I'm not musical. I'm like, but you've experienced music. You might say you hate it. <laughs> you know, whenever I used to get patients, I'm like, I don't like music. I was like, okay, but <laughs> you remember these songs because you heard them or your parents sang them to you or your grandparents. Like it can spark something. It can spark a memory. It can take you back to a time. And I think that's, I honestly feel like that's so amazing that our brains are wired in a way where like music is the thing that can bring you back take you but take you back or like bring you back to now uh, i love it yep me too oh, i love talking about music with people who love music <laughs> me too it is so fun <laughs> so i just had another question um so what was your favorite part about being a music therapist like I know that you know having music as something that you can connect to people with was awesome but like what in the music therapy realm was your favorite part you know what I loved I loved showing the outside world what is possible so like with for okay like for example my last um professional music therapy job was working in the school with at-risk youth and sadly, the kids that I was working with, their schools had kind of thrown them away. You know, mm -hmm. we were the stop between, we were the stop before they were sent to um, juvenile detention centers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the schools would say, these kids can't work with one another. They have anger outbursts. They're not focused. I would have, I could get these kids to sit at a computer in groups of three or four we produced songs. So like um, I had them producing their own songs, writing their own songs, produce tracks together. Mm. And then we put on, uh, we called it the Garage Band Grammys. And we would invite their schools, their principals or their social workers and counselors from their schools. And we even would do concerts where, you know, the kids were considered like problem kids in their classes and they're up there leading the class or playing instruments. And so it, I just loved showing the outside world that has given up on, on someone. Like I just enjoyed um, showing them that there's, there's still hope. There's yes. hope in this kid. You can't give up on people, you know? Um, and I think I enjoy that with, uh, even with those that are experiencing incarceration, you know, uh, a lot of times they're like, you know, I hate when you hear from officers like, well, that one's going to be a problem, you know, you're going to have issues out of these two. And meanwhile, they're the best ones in the group. And they're the main ones up front, like telling their testimony. And like, they've written the most in class. And I, I think that's my favorite is just like showing making the impossible happen, you know, um, reminding people not to give up on those that they've given up on. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> that is beautiful. Will I cry? Remain. 
but that's so true. It's, it, that's, that's very, very true. The, the populations and the people that are so easily tossed away mm -hmm. um, for various reasons. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's incredible. And the work that you did and continue to do with your new venture is so unbelievably important because the people mm -hmm. that are forgotten so often are the ones that are movers and shakers and, and world changers. Yeah, and the fact that we need their stories. We need to hear what they've lived through, what they've been through, how they got there and how they got out. You know what I mean? We need a roadmap because their story is someone else's and there's power in numbers. So when you know that you're not walking this road alone, you know, like, why are we silencing those voices and those stories? They need to be heard to help someone else. Um, so, yeah, I am always finding like, who don't y'all believe in? I'll go there. <laughs> 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 rolling up your sleeves right yeah now. bring it on let's go <laughs> yes. that's awesome the world needs more people like you who are willing to do that so no, thank you for being that person thank you so kind <laughs> eris do you have any more music therapy oriented questions um do i have any more um no i don't think i have any more uh I think I, I think all the nails have been hit on this. <laughs> yeah, I think that's everything. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so wonderful to hear your experience as a music therapist, and and to hear how you used your work as a music therapist to feed other parts of your life and other things that you're able to do. Yeah. Um, that is just so inspiring to me. Oop! Now I thought of another question. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So you said that you play piano, oboe, French horn, and you're a vocalist. Oh, English horn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. English oh, horn. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So many instruments. How did you balance all of those different forms of instrumentation in session? Like, how did you know which ones to bring in? How did you know which ones to leave at the door? Yeah. You know, when I, where I studied, I'm not sure what it was like for you, but we had to learn how to play everything. So it was, we took a class where we had to learn how to play guitar. We had to learn how to play auto harp. We had to learn, um, how to play drums. So African drums. And, um, we learned how to, how to learn how to play drum set. I played in the steel band, but I, I like, was like, I'll keep going with that. That's fun. Um, so it was required of us. We had to do, um, sessions with all the instruments and we had wow. to demonstrate that in our clinical work in college. And what I found was um, I quickly put the oboe away because I was like, that's not easy unless we're doing like just a passive listening, you know, but the, the populations I work with are generally, I have to be mobile. And so I'm usually walking around. So I just lean more on guitar for most of my sessions. But when I was working with kids, there were times where sitting at the drums, the drum set or sitting on a keyboard really worked better. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, uh, you know, the population of kids sometimes like instruments really affected if they were interested or not, <laughs> you know? And it's still like that today. If I pick up a guitar and I go in and people are like, I don't want to hear no country music. I'm like, not country, but okay. I'll pick up the piano instead. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it depended on where I was going, what the facility looked like, how quickly I needed to get out of there. You know, um, if, if I needed to pack up and go quick, then could I just throw a guitar and something and go? Um, sometimes I'll only use a drum. There were times I only used a djembe drum for sessions. Um, and, you know, that, yeah, I would do full sessions with just drums in my voice. So I think I would even just challenge myself sometimes and be like, all right, today we're only using a kalimba. And, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Just, I, I enjoyed a challenge and, and it made me think outside the box and I found it made it easier to show the clients that they don't have to know how to play an instrument in order to access what we were showing them that day. So, especially if we were writing mantras, I was like, we're not going to write it on an instrument. We're going to put write, write it with just drums because y'all can beat on a table or, you know, clap your hands and then sing the melodies. That's all you need. You know, yeah, switch it up. <laughs> Yeah, my experience was not like that. I wish that I got to learn as many instruments as you, as you oh, know. Cool. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, we were just required to learn piano, guitar, and be able to vocalize and, and sing. Um, 
Yeah, I went to Berkeley College of Music, and that's okay. what they mainly focused on there. Yeah. But wow, I mean, the harp? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> auto harp. Mm -hmm. You know, like the 70s wow. with the little push buttons, and you had a, oh yeah, we had to know how to tune them. <laughs> we had to know how to, uh, yeah, there was a lot we had to know. And, you know, we still took our woodwind methods and, and, and brass methods and, mm -hmm. you know, violin. But, you know, so I can pick up other instruments and work it out, you know. Yes. Um, but I, I loved uh, also knowing how to get the minimal amount out so I could hand a trumpet to a, a, a client and be like, all right, here's how you make a sound and just seeing the expression on their face. Because the whole point I find in music therapy is you're not trying to make, you don't want anybody to be perfect at something. You're not trying to master it, right? The mm -hmm. whole point is just setting them up for success right? Just making the moment successful for them. So, you know, just knowing how to tune a guitar and open strumming and an open chord and just put your finger here. There's a G, you know, I was like, oh my God, I could play, you know, I uh, love playing around with that and keeping things as simple as possible. Wow. You're like a Swiss army knife with that. That's so cool. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> I'm gonna make a patch and like, I'm the Swiss Army knife. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> yes. Wow. I think those are all my music therapy questions. Yeah. Yeah. That last one was a good one. That was a very good <laughs> logistics question when it because being able to have that many instruments under your belt to be able to utilize how do you use that? When do you decide to use that? That was a very, very good question. <laughs> All right. So to wrap it up, I feel like, and I feel like my screen just got real bright. To wrap it up, <laughs> um, so I wanted just to talk a little bit about your show upcoming in Statesville. I believe it's November 5th. Um, mm -hmm. oh my God, I'm like, let me pull up the calendar. Yes. I know you're, you're, <laughs> you're a very busy woman. You've got lots going on. Yes, November 5th. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just to get some more details on that so that I know exactly what to tell the good yeah. people of Iredell County um, if they're interested in coming out to see you and to learn about what you do. Yeah, so it's going to be on November 5th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, it starts at, at Iredell Arts Council, which I, which I just looked up and saw it's at the Old County Jail. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's really fun. <laughs> right up my alley. Um, and uh, to be honest, I think the last message that I got from them is that they're doing limited seating. So only like 20 to 25 people are allowed, like are, they're selling tickets for 20, 25 people. And then they're live streaming it as well. Mm. Yeah, so they'll be doing both. Um, but I am sure if you go ahead and buy those tickets, they will send you all the info to let you know if they've sold out or not. And who knows? I don't know what the numbers are looking like up there in North Carolina, but if they're low, maybe they'll, you know, bring the number back up to who can come in, mm -hmm. in the space. Yeah. Good to know that they'll be live streaming it. Do you know how long your, do you know how long it's going to run? Because I will be in parent teacher conferences okay. and I would love to be able to race down if possible. <laughs> yeah. I believe it's a, uh, a 90 minute set, I believe. So I think an hour and a half. Yeah. Very I nice. Could add down to you to be able yeah. to go. I might, I might buy a ticket. So you might have a lonely seat in there, but you'll see marching. <laughs> yeah, in the come on. All <laughs> of them. It would be great to meet you in person. <laughs> I would love to meet you in person. How yeah. often are you in the North Carolina area when it comes to like, like around Charlotte? Um, you know what? It was just starting to like, I don't know why I got, I just started burning up in my apartment. I'm sorry. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> it happened. The heat came on. <laughs> or I'm having a hot flash. I don't know. Um, I, I was coming around North Carolina a lot. Uh, and then um, like I was playing, oh Lord, what's the name of that town? There was a place called the Peacock Theater I was playing. I've been in Charlotte a few times. Um, and then, yeah, I usually, I usually come to North Carolina at least three to four times, I feel like a year, you know, so once a quarter. Um, but this will be the first time in a while. So this might be the first time this year I've been up that way. So it'll be nice. Yeah, there are a lot of things that were impeding you. Uh, yeah, this year. Just, just a few. <laughs> just, just a few. Thing. Just yeah. A few <laughs> Awesome. So just to plug for your social medias, where can people find you via Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever socials you have, where can people find you? Yeah. So um, on Instagram and Facebook, it's Kashana Music, uh, K-Y-S-H-O-N-A Music right there. And then um, uh, my website is Kashana.com. 
and Twitter is just Kashana. I'm honestly, there's not that many of me out there. There's uh, a few Kashanas that are speakers, but uh, I'm the only one with a guitar or like a serious face and a head wrap on <laughs> all her pictures. So, <laughs> good to know. Those pictures are awesome, by the way. Ah, uh, thank I'm you. Brick wall, love them. <laughs> yes, they're very nice. Thank you so much for talking to us. This was really, really, really cool. Thanks yes. for having me. <laughs> Uh, if I can't make it uh, in person, I'll definitely be live streaming. <laughs> yes. I'm going to live stream too. Yeah, <laughs> come on, live stream it, y'all. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this was amazing. And thank you again so, so much for joining us. And um, hopefully we can talk again in the future about more fun music therapy things. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Iris. Thank you, Melody. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye. Bye, you guys. Bye. La, la, la.